Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the time we get to spend together here as a family, Lord. Uh, under you, under your, under your word, Lord, let us uh, take it in, Lord, today and uh, be able to share it with the world, Lord. We uh, thank you for the music that you are providing us with today, Lord. Let it give you all the praise and all the glory, and uh, let's just worship you forever in, in our days, Lord. We just thank you for being in this house today, and we just thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Take 
take these hands I know they're empty but with you they can be used for beauty in your perfect plan all I am is yours take these feet I know they stumble but you The humble, so please use me. All I am is yours. I give you all my life. I'm letting it go. A living sacrifice, no longer my own. Shine it in the dark I want to tell the world of who you are All I am is yours I give you all my life I'm letting it go A living sacrifice No longer my own All I am I lift my hands up, God, I surrender to you. I lift my hands up, God, I surrender all that I am for your glory, your honor, your fame. I lift my hands up, God, I surrender to you. I'm letting it go, a living sacrifice, no longer my own. All I am is yours, all I am is yours. I give you everything, to you I belong. Every beat of my heart, the breath in my lungs, all I am is yours, all I am Give it up to the Lord. Hey. Hallelujah. Let's keep it going. Let this be our anthem. Let's it to you. Only to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. We thank you. So many reasons. Too many to count. Say that I love you to worship you now. Your love is perfect, and your heart is mine, and I'm yours forever. Forever, you're mine. Jesus, the anthem of my heart. Jesus, the anchor of my soul. I'm overwhelmed by all you are. Oh, how I love you. You call me beloved. Call me friend. Your grace 
says I'm worthy You welcome me in Now all that I long for And all that I need Is to be in your presence Forever I fall at your feet Jesus, the anthem of my heart. Jesus, the anchor of my soul. I'm overwhelmed by all you are. Oh, how I love you. Jesus, the anthem of my heart. Jesus, the anchor. you are in this building today we feel your presence we thank you and we love you for everything that you do in our lives lord we thank you for the music we thank you for this worship lord lord just be with us here we just ask that uh, you put the word into our hearts lord and we just continue to serve you every single day of our lives we thank you we love you in jesus name we pray amen Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. <clears throat> um, there were some who were really sacrificing and laboring for the Lord yesterday. They, they called it a fun run. It was? Okay, you're proving me wrong because <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> and it was from here to Kihei. And um, I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jennifer, no one ended up in the hospital, right? Okay. <laughs> and no one ended up at the morgue, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 
they labored for the Lord, and I understand that the, the fundraising went really well. And so um, much will be done for the kingdom of God with, that, with those funds that were raised. So thank God for those who sacrificed their bodies and their Saturday morning and went and, and, and um, did that. We need to continue to be in prayer for people in our church um, who are grieving the loss of loved ones, and we have several in the church that are going through that that um, trial at this time. There are some who are in our church that are, are going through medical trials. Um, uh, there are some who are um, looking to God for provision for various things. Um, some who are going through relational difficulties. And so we need to lift all of our people up. But we need to be lifting up the people in our community and the people in the world because we are a world that is not at peace. Uh, we need to be praying that um, the love and the grace of God will bring peace to this world. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we um, uh, lift these concerns up. Heavenly Father, there are so many different kinds of concerns. Um, and Lord, we know that these concerns are not unusual because people all over the world face these things. But Lord, there is grief because of the loss of loved ones. There is, there is the trials of medical trials, um, those who have recently had surgery and those who are recovering. Lord, we lift them up to you. Those who are looking for your provision, for a job, for, um, for a place to stay, for the resources, Lord, to, to be able to accomplish what they believe you have placed before them. Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, for the relational difficulties that are ahead, Lord, I pray that these would just really look to you, the author and finisher of their faith, Lord, and put their trust in you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that the relationships would be resolved to be the ones that that you have determined, Lord. So, Lord, we place them in your hands. And, Lord, there is so much unrest in our world today. Um, we face that unrest here in our own community, but all over the world as well. Lord, I, I am especially concerned with what's going on in Hong Kong today. And so, Lord, we just lift up all of these situations of great distress and unrest. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, rise up, Lord, and you would deal with each of these situations. For, Father, we know that you are the answer for everything that, that confronts us. So, Lord, help us through these trials to put our trust and our faith in you and never to become discouraged, but, Lord, always to be confident that you are in control. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to look at our study through um, Thessalonians. We completed 1 Thessalonians last week, and today we begin with 2 Thessalonians. But um, 2 Thessalonians is rather short. There's only three chapters, and we're going to cover chapter 1 this morning. So, um, in chapter 1, um, Paul was really trying to tell the Thessalon Thessalonians that, hey, um, you can rest assured Christ is coming back. Um, how many of you know without a, uh, without a shadow of doubt, you know that Jesus is coming back? Okay. Does that give you comfort? Paul was trying to give them comfort. But what happened was some of these people misunderstood. They knew that Christ was coming back, but they thought he was going to come back real soon. So some of them even quit their jobs and were just waiting for Christ to come back. So although all of you raised your hands, none of you have quit your jobs, right? <laughs> because Scripture does say no one knows when the Lord's coming back. Okay, so um, we don't know when he's coming back, but we know that he's coming back. And knowing that he's coming back should give you the motivation the inspiration to continue to move forward no matter what happens. So therefore, we're looking at chapter 1 and looking at this thought, victory and honor 
even through crisis, even through crisis. How many of you in the last year you faced a crisis? Anybody? How many of you currently are facing a crisis? How many of you in the future are going to face a crisis? Okay, keep your hands up. You see all the number of hands that are down? You with your hands up, get close to them. Because they're not going to face a crisis in the future. So um, I think they didn't raise their hand because they're just shy. Because all of us are going to face some kind of crisis in the future. All of us are going to face a crisis in the future. But as you face that crisis, may you have, number one, flourishing faith. A flourishing faith. That's what the Thessalonians had. In verses 1 through 4, Paul says here, This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. These guys are well known in the church. Okay? And so Paul, Silas, and Timothy are putting their stamp on this letter. And they said, We are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the church. Now, you can also be thinking, this letter is written to you, the church. All of you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help But thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. Flourishing faith, growing love. Verse 4, we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. So, dear people, this is the beginning part. And it's flavoring where we're going to go. But it starts off by saying, you belong to the Lord. Okay? That is something significant. Do you guys remember when you didn't belong to the Lord? Isn't there a big difference in your life? Pre-Christ, post-Christ. When you're with the Lord, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? So this letter is addressed to you who belong to Christ. You're a different kind of person. You're a, in fact, the world looks at you and say, and says, you're peculiar. Look around, around you. Some of you, you have broken neck because you cannot move your head. But look around you, okay? The person sitting next to you is peculiar. Did you know that? I see some wives looking at their husband and the eyes are saying a lot. Saying, I knew that. You didn't have to tell me that. (laughs) Um, You are peculiar because Christ lives in you. You're thinking differently. Probably in some of your lives, your speech has radically changed. Probably where you go has been Filtered now by Christ. You don't go to all the places that you used to. You don't even say the kind of things that you used to say. Your goals are being changed. Because Christ is creating a new person in you. You belong to the Lord. And so therefore, understand this. Because you belong to the Lord, there are others praying for you, praying that grace and peace be gifted to you, that grace and peace be gifted to you. You know what? We need to be people in a world that is not a grateful world, that is not a gracious world. You need to be gracious in an ungrateful world. You need to be peaceful in a world of war. You know, when, a, when you, who have Christ living in you, walk into a situation that's tense, you need to be bringing 
peace into that situation. Not your peace, but the peace that Christ gives you. Bring peace in a warring situation. And then Paul, Silas, and Timothy are so grateful, so thankful for growing and flourishing faith. You know what, dear people? Don't look to get to a certain point in your faith, and when you get there, think, okay, that's what I wanted, and you stop there. Okay? Always keep growing and flourishing in your faith. Never stop growing and flourishing in your faith. Because the reality is, when you stop growing and flourishing, when you stop moving forward in your relationship with Christ, you are actually not standing stagnant. You are actually moving backwards. You're either moving forward or backwards in your relationship with Christ. You're becoming all the person that Christ wants you to be, or you're yielding to the influences of Satan and going the direction that he wants you to go in. Okay. So we need to constantly be growing and flourishing in our faith. Paul was thankful to the Thessalonians because that's what they were doing. They were doing that. And, you know, the, um, let me quote something from a, uh, from a commentator. The good news was that they were continuing to grow in their faith. But the bad news was that false teachings about Christ's return were spreading, leading many to quit their jobs and wait for the end of the world. While the purpose of Paul's first letter, the first Thessalonians, was to confront the Thessalonians with the assurance of Christ's second coming, the purpose of this second letter is to correct the false teaching about the second coming. You know Christ is coming. You've, you're moving forward in your faith. So you might get the thought, well, I can just rest on what has happened in the past. And that, that will take me into the future. No. Keep on striving to be all that God wants you to be. Have a flourishing and growing faith. So flourishing faith. You can tell that you have a flourishing faith when disappointments don't quench your faith. Disappointments not going to quench it because you know that God is in control. You know that he is in control even of this situation that is full of disappointments. You know he's in control. So you don't let disappointments quench your faith. Rather, you let disappointments and challenges build your faith. Okay, you hear that? You're not going to let the disappointments and challenges of life quench your faith. You're going to let disappointments and challenges of life build your faith. Okay? Like it's going to build your faith. Now, I understand game might be over now, but I, I understand that the Maui Little League team is playing today, right? I don't know if any of you are following them, but they're in the West Coast? I mean, excuse me, East Coast. Pennsylvania. Not on the coast. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're in the East somewhere. And I think um, someone told me the game started at 8. Now, this is a team. They're, are, they, are they in the finals today? No, final still to come. Okay, so I know that they won on Friday, okay. and they won quite convincingly. Do you think this th team ever had disappointments and challenges? Probably so, yeah. Did they let those disappointments and challenges quench and cause them to get squashed? Or did they allow those disappointments and challenges to challenge them and cause them to go forward? In your lives, when you face disappointments and challenges, not the time to give up, the time to trust in God and just let him be in control of everything. So you come to the point of trusting him more fully rather than doubting him. Because Satan wants you to doubt. 
Satan wants you to doubt so much that he kind of brings you into a state of paralysis, spiritual paralysis. God wants you to be built by these challenges. So you let disappointments and challenges build you. And there needs to be a growing love. You know that your love is growing when you can love the unlovely. Okay? You know your love is growing when you can love the unlovely. Doesn't take much love to love someone who's really lovely, right? Takes a whole lot of love to love the unlovely. And dear people, you and I need to rise to the occasion when unlovely people Unlovely circumstances surround us. We need to still be people of love. We need to have a flourishing faith and growing love. Love in spite of hatred and evil. Okay, Love in spite of hatred and evil. Man, I, I encourage you to try and pick up uh, and learn about those who are suffering for their faith uh, around the world. Uh, many of these stories come out of China. And you'll find that those who get arrested for their faith go, many of them spend years and years in prison. They're not, you would think they come out of prison with a lot of hate. They come out of prison with much more love because they've experienced God's power to cause them to love in prison even the most despicable people. Even the guards who bring torture and just shame upon them, they, God has given them the power to continue to love in those kinds of situations. Dear people, that is amazing. So love in spite of hatred and evil. Let love shine more brightly in darkness. Really important that we do that. Let love shine more brightly in darkness. Now, this causes, because the, the Thessalonians are already doing this, this causes Paul, Timothy, and Silas to be proud of their endurance and faithfulness. He's proud of their endurance. Man, it takes endurance. It's not easy. And in their endurance, there is a great deal of faithfulness. Paul is proud of them. And this is in spite of all the persecutions that they're going through. All of the hardships that they're going through. They are going through many sufferings. It's not easy for the Thessalonians. But they're still growing in love. They're flourishing in faith. In spite of persecution, hardships, sufferings. They're growing. They are doing it. Does that mean you and I can do it too? Now, I am proud of Valley Owl Fellowship. I'm proud of you, the people of Valley Owl Fellowship. You may not feel it when I'm preaching, but I am. Um, you guys are awesome. But there is room for us to grow. There is room for us to get refined. And I'm looking forward to us continuing to flourish in faith, to come to the point of of growing, continue to grow in our love for the Lord. But God is good. I see that happening already. So therefore, we can be proud, but not prideful. Okay? Pride will kill us. Pride will kill us. But we can be proud of what God is doing in and through us. It's not us doing it. I know for me, I'm a dirty, rotten person. So I have a standing comment to many of you. When you ask how I'm doing, I'm, I, I tell you what, mean and nasty. <laughs> but, dear people, I'm joking with you, yes. But in reality, that's true because that's who I am deep down inside, mean and nasty. But Christ is helping me to overcome it. But I'm still mean and nasty. I need you to pray. How many of you need 
the rest of the body to pray for you. Okay? You're in the same boat with me. You're mean and nasty too. <laughs> and we all need to be praying for each other. Commentator says this, the keys to surviving persecution and trials are endurance and faithfulness. When faced with crushing troubles, we can have faith that God is using our trials for our good and for his glory. Do you think that's true? God is using our suffering for his good and for his glory. It goes on. Knowing that God is fair and just will give us patience in our suffering because we know that he has not forgotten us. In God's perfect timing, he will relieve our suffering and punish those who persecute us. How many of you have gotten mad with somebody and have sought revenge? In a very twisted way, let me give you a different perspective. Better for you not to take Revenge on that person because you're lousy at it. Better for you. Now, I'm saying this is twisted. Better for you to leave them in God's hands. God can take care of them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We can do that. Leave it in God's hands. <clears throat> and then, <sighs> question is, do you trust God? Do you trust his timing? Or would you rather take things into your own hands? Do you trust God's timing? That is the first step towards growing in endurance and faithfulness. So Paul had to point out that while waiting for God's kingdom, believers could and should grow in their endurance and faithfulness through the hardships they were suffering. Through the hardships they were suffering. Now, if you study um, biblical prophecy, the world doesn't get better and better and better until we get to the point where, oh, great, the next step is heaven because we've just progressed so far and then heaven. The story is quite different. The world gets worse and worse and worse to the point where God has to come and bring home his people. So what Paul, Silas, and Timothy are saying here is, the world is going to continue to get worse. But you continue to grow in your love and flourish in your faith. <clears throat> Number two, God uses suffering or persecution for good. Um, there's a saying that many of you know in this church. It goes, God is good. And all the time, how many of you really believe that? Or is that just a saying? All the time? All means all? Every day? Even the days in between? <laughs> Every day. All the time, God is good? All the time. It's easy to have that in your head. It's difficult. To have it in your heart. Because when you're going through tough times, it's hard to believe God is good even in those tough times. But God uses persecution. God uses even evil for his good. Verse 5. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. God is good. God will use his, use his persecution to show his justice. To show his justice. That's an A. Verse 5 says, and God will use persecution to what? Show his justice. To show his justice. Um, therefore, it's going to really be important for you and I.
to understand that and to act on it. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord what? With all your heart. All means all. I think the reality is, for many of us, we trust in the Lord with some of our heart. I think that's reality, isn't it? Because all means all. And do we trust him with all of our heart? Um, But we should be moving on to all, right? Moving away from some to all. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And then it does not stop there, but it goes on. And do not depend on your own understanding. That's what that verse says, right? Now, in Romans 8, 28, it says something else. It says, and we know that God causes some of the things. Some of the things. No, it says everything to work together for good. Everything to work together for good. For the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. Now, dear people, look at this verse of scripture. The last part of it says, for those, uh, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You love God, right? You have allowed God to call you according to his purpose. So everything that happens to you can work out for good. For you, not for the world, but for you. Why? Because you're trusting in God to let everything be worked out according to his perfect plan. If you start to mess with it, you start to mess with God's plan, you could mess it up. How many of you have ever messed up God's plan for you? I have. Boy, didn't you at that time want the opportunity to make the correction? But you know, the beauty of God is that when we mess up, we repent. First of all, we confess, repent, Turn back to him. He corrects our mistakes. Isn't that right? Every mess that you got yourself into, he gave you a way out, right? He corrected, (laughs) made it right. We got a great God. He doesn't leave you in your mess. Now, there's consequences that we have to live with, but he begins to make everything right again. Oh, we got a great, great God. So, we got to learn to trust in God with everything because we know that he's going to work out everything for our good. This shows his justice. Um, commentator says, as we live for Christ, we will experience trouble. That doesn't sound good, does it? We will experience trouble. And the reason this commentator says that is because we are trying to be God's people in a perverse world. Some people say that troubles are the result of sin or lack of faith. But Paul teaches that they may be part of God's plan for believers. Our problems can help us look upward and forward instead of inward. They can build strong character, and they can provide us with opportunities to comfort others who are struggling. I like that from that commentator because he's saying that those trials can build character in us so that we can basically rise above those challenges. But it doesn't stop there because this commentator says, so you can help others really important. All of you have had sin in your life. All of you have had terrible mistakes in your life. You need to turn your sins and your mistakes 
over to the Lord and let him use it. You know, in many recovery programs, the staff of the recovery program is made up of who? People who have recovered. They are letting their past failures become helpful to others. Dear people, we need to let our past sins and our past failures be helpful to our brothers and sisters in Christ and help them or those who need to still turn to the Lord and they may turn to the Lord through the difficulties that they're facing. So the commentator is saying, you're, you're going to be a comfort to others who are struggling. Your troubles may be an indication that you are taking a stand for Christ. When you do so, you are experiencing the privilege of showing that you are worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, that's important. You are worthy of the kingdom of God. Dear people, so many people in this world have the mistaken idea that when you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, they adopt the old Coca-Cola um, slogan. Things go better with Coke? Uh-uh. Things go better with Pepsi. <clears throat> but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but many people have said things go better with Christ. You know, if that be true, how come many who accept Jesus in the next moments of their life face eternity? Because to accept Jesus means death. And so they go into eternity. So is it true that things go better with Christ? Yes, if you look at it from the perspective that God means for it to be taken God did not send Jesus to forgive you of your sins so that you could have a great life here on earth. Very easy, um, very convenient. Um, things go better with, with Christ. Not that way. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we can have eternal life. Eternal life. So that we can have heaven. Those who die without Christ, I don't like saying this, but this is so true. Those who die without Christ spend eternity in hell. I don't know how you feel about that. That just brings me so much grief because there is no escape from hell. No escape from hell. And hell Last an eternity. It'll never end. And you know, for you and I, when you come to know the reality of hell, you will not want even your worst enemy to end up in hell because it is so horrible. It is so terrible. Jesus came, died on the cross so that no one would have to go to hell. But he does not force that down people's throats. People are free to choose whether they are going to accept Jesus or not. Those who do not accept Jesus, those who do not ex accept Jesus, will spend an eternity in hell. Jesus came so that you and I can have life eternal life eternal not a great life here on earth some of you oh you really work hard things don't necessarily get better for you but your purpose here on earth is to glorify Jesus and to help others come to know him not for you to have a glorious life here on earth we need to work while it is still day because the night is coming when no one can work. We need to work and serve and, and glorify the Lord until we are called home. So therefore, God uses persecution to show his justice, but be also to make 
you worthy, to make you worthy. Verse 5 says, um, and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. Now, dear people, understand this. Understand this. He's allowing the suffering to come into your life to make you worthy to be in his kingdom. To be in his kingdom. Without the suffering, how do you know you're going you, you're gonna to turn to the Lord? It's really important that we turn to the Lord. No. Now, understand this. In Revelations chapter 21, verse 27, it says this. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's Revelations 21, 27. It's not in your notes. It's not on the screen. But Revelations 21, 27 says nothing and no one evil is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So God is allowing suffering to refine you so that you could enter into eternal life. All the, the junk in your life, being taken out now those of you who raised your hand earlier um there's been a difference in your life right from before christ to after christ right isn't christ hasn't he allowed um some suffering in your life to make you to allow you to come to this point that you are he's allowing suffering to come into your life to remove the junk in your life it's like Going through the refiner's fire to, to take out all the junk in your life. So, he's making you worthy to be in his kingdom. And the suffering makes you worthy. The suffering makes you worthy. In First Peter verses thir- uh, 3, verses 14 to 17, this is not in your notes as well, and it's not on the screen. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 17 says, But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for, for doing good it, if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. So you might feel that the suffering is unjust. You're being persecuted and, and, and really beat over the head for something that's not true, right? Now, if that's happening, that's not right. But that's not a reason to lose faith and hope in the Lord because Jesus himself went through that, right? When he got arrested, he got arrested on false charges, right? When he went to the court. False witnesses were put up against him. So if anybody had a right to be angry and mad and just mean and nasty, Jesus had the right to do it. But did he do that? You and I as Christians need to have Jesus as the primary person that we're trying to be like, trying to be like him. We need to be able to say in our heart, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We need to be loving to very unlovely people. We need to be like Jesus. So, suffering for him makes you worthy. It's giving you a chance to exercise that faith. And vengeance will be his. That's what it says in verse 6. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. So he's going to do it. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto, unto wrath. 
For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's in the King James Version. I think it says it better there than in the version that I usually use, which is the NLT. I think it really speaks when the Lord says, vengeance is mine. So do you have a right to take vengeance on somebody? You really don't if you're going to be the man, the woman that Christ wants you to be. Many have brought shame to the Lord by seeking vengeance. They bring shame to the Lord by seeking revenge instead of leaving it to the Lord. Really important to just leave it with the Lord. You can trust that God will prevail. That's the God will prevail. In verse 7, the beginning part of it, it says, And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears. He's going to provide rest for you. Now, there's two ways to take the rest. We can rest in knowing that our sufferings are strengthening us, making us ready for Jesus' kingdom. (laughs) Suffering and thinking, oh, okay, I can rest because God is strengthening me. That's hard to do. But it can give you rest when you know that God is using that situation. We can be also rest in the fact that one day everyone will stand before God. At that time, wrongs will be righted, judgment will be pronounced, and evil will be terminated. Dear people, um, those who persecute you for Christ's sake will probably end up in hell they end up in hell, God is going to take care of their disobedience and their evil. But you know what, dear people? You know, instead of saying, yeah, do it to them, Lord, it should break our heart. Because they're going to end up in eternal suffering with no chance of escape. You really should change your heart and start praying for them that God will show mercy on them And that he will bring them to their knees and bring them to himself before it's too late. We need to be praying for people like that so that they will not end up in hell. Because, dear people, one day Jesus is coming back. Jesus will return. That's E. Jesus will return. Excuse me, that's two. Um, Jesus will return. And when he returns, it's too late for those who have not given their lives to Christ. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, it says, And though your faith, and excuse me, through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive his salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your, though your faith is for far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Dear people, the faith that God has given to you, he will protect it. He will protect it until he can fulfill all of his promises to you. And you might say, well, gosh, what about all the people who have have fallen away? They were once really great Christians. Now they live like the devil. Dear people, I don't know. I can, I can honestly tell you, I don't know about them. But I can also tell you this. We can leave them to the Lord. We can leave them to the Lord. Let the Lord judge them, not us. But I can tell you this. I believe this passage was fulfilled in the first century with Christians who were being tortured in horrible ways. Those who were being dipped in oil and used as human torches, 
those who are being thrown into the arenas and wild lions set on them, they never gave their love and faith in Jesus. Jesus saw them through all of those trials, and today they're safe in the hands of God. God can see us through the same way and keep us safe in his hands no matter how evil and horrendous the situation may be around us. He can see us through. So number three, God assures justice. He will bring justice one day. Verse 7b, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you who believe what he told you about him. Now this verse of scripture says, Jesus is not coming alone. He coming with a with an army of angels. It's going to be a mighty appearance. But that time when he comes, he's going to be bringing judgment on two groups of people. On those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news. So, A, angels will come with the Lord in judgment. And it's going to come on those refusing to obey the Lord. You guys know the story of the rich man and Lazarus found in Luke 16, verses 19 through 31? I'm not going to read this whole passage, but just kind of recount it to you, okay? The rich man is rich. He enjoys all of the luxuries of his wealth. And then you got Lazarus, who is so poor that he's eating from the scraps that fall from the, the rich man's table. He's so poor that when he got sores, the dogs come and lick his sores. I mean, he is, he is in destitute. Both of them die. The rich man finds himself in torment. And then he sees Abraham and Lazarus. And he begs, he calls out and begs Abraham to send Lazarus with just a drop of water on his, his finger so he can drop it on his tongue, so he can have a little bit of quenching. And Abraham says, no, there's a big, there's this big chasm between us. No one can cross over. So the rich man, I think, understands that he can't get any relief. So his thoughts and his mind turns to his family behind. He says, Abraham, send Lazarus back because I got five brothers. You know, that, that plea tells me that he's got five brothers who are living the same way that he lived, and so they're coming to the same place he's in, and he doesn't want that. And Abraham says, they won't believe if someone from the dead goes back. They won't believe. They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't even believe you, believe Lazarus if I sent Lazarus back. Dear people, that's a really heart-wrenching story. Because think about the pain of this man. He's in suffering. He wants just one drop of water to quench his suffering. And then when he realizes that suffering is not, um, is not going to be quenched, then he falls into even greater suffering, thinking about his loved ones behind. If you've ever had someone that you love pass without your knowledge of whether they're saved or not, whether they're saved or not, I think, now this is crazy Steve talking, I think you might be able to bring 
just a little bit of comfort to them by doing the best you can in sharing with loved ones that remain here that don't know the Lord. That was the desire of the, of the rich man. Send Lazarus back because I got five brothers. Five brothers. And they can probably come here. Dear people, I once heard a, a lady say after her husband died of cancer, I don't know where my husband is, but wherever he's at, that's where I'm going to be. I don't think her husband really wanted her to join him because this is a man that I witnessed to, and he came to the point of saying, Steve, I understand what you're saying, but I've been a Buddhist my whole life. I'm going to die a Buddhist. I think, dear people, we would not want to see anyone go to hell. We got to use the suffering in our life to refine us and to help us to become all that he wants us to be. Because when God, when Jesus comes back again, eternal judgment will be brought. That's seed. Judgment will bring eternal judgment. Jesus didn't suffer and die on the cross so that you could have the American dream. Jesus came and died on the cross so that you can have life eternal. He came to give you eternal joy, not temporary joy. Dear people, I can't tell you. I can't stress enough how important this is. We got to give up living for ourselves. And we got to really embrace loving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul and live for him. Live for him. Because we don't know when the Lord comes back. What if you're halfway towards getting the American dream when the Lord comes back? You spent your life living for the Lord because you're in your mind. You're thinking, once I retire, then I'm going to start living 100% for the Lord. But you're only halfway there in getting that American dream. And then the Lord comes back. How are you going to address the Lord when you have to meet him? Dear people, we've got to live for the Lord now. Place the American dream in his hands. If he wants you to get it, fine. But you're striving for what he desires, not what you desire. We've got to live for him because eternal punishment is coming. Maybe not for you, but for the people that God had intended for you to reach out to. Man, that should break our heart. That someone else's salvation... My life could be pivotal for them. So I got to live my life the way God wants me to live it. You see, dear people, God will receive glory and honor for all the things he said. He said he will not let anyone or anything evil into heaven. That means, dear people, when we get to heaven... We're not going to have to repeat this whole bloody mess here on earth. We're going to have eternal joy. But, dear people, there's going to be others that are not going to receive that. Because the scripture says, wide is the road that leads to destruction. How many are on that road? Many. Narrow is the road that leads to life eternal. How many are on that road? Few. Dear people, we need to do all that we can to increase the few. Last point. We need to live a life worthy of God's calling. Verses 11 and 12. So we keep on praying for you, asking God, our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. And you will be honored along with him. 
This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. My belief is this. Valley Isle Fellowship doesn't have to have great programs. Valley Isle Fellowship doesn't have to have great ministries to reach our world. But Valley Isle Fellowship has to have great people, great lovers of the Lord. Because if Valley Isle Fellowship has great lovers of the Lord, great people, wherever you go, you will take the name of Christ with you. More important than great programs, great ministries, is great people. I remember um, something when I was in seminary. I think it was from E.M. Bounds. He said, God is looking not for great machinery, not for great methods, but for great men. I really believe God is looking for great people who will live this way, live this way. And therefore, in verse 11, Paul says that he's, they keep praying for I keep praying for you. We need to keep praying for each other. We have a Monday night prayer meeting I invite all of you to come to. We continually pray for this church. We continue to pray for God to enable all of us to live a life worthy, a worthy life. That we would all live a worthy life. That he will give power to accomplish his call upon each one of us. God will accomplish his call upon each one of us. That God would bring honor, excuse me, that we would bring honor to the Lord by the way we live. No matter where you're placed, no matter where you might go, that you'd bring honor and glory to the Lord wherever he places you. You know, your job, your community, and especially the home and the family that you're in is your mission fuel. Always live up to being all that God wants you to be. And then... We need to see that people honor us, not because of who we are, but because of who the Lord is in us. You ever come maybe to work and then everybody starts saying, shh, Steve's here. <laughs> so that means that's kind of the, the slow, I mean, the, the secret um, what do you call it, slogan or uh, secret thing that goes out to stop your swearing <laughs> because you're there. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because they recognize Christ in you. We need to be praying that the power of God's grace really lives mightily in us. Always be a person of grace. Don't be known as someone who, I don't know if I can say this to him because he's going to get mad. Instead of getting mad, be glad. Be glad that you have a chance to really shine for Jesus. Because where there is darkness, the light can shine most bright. So no matter how bad it gets around you, let Jesus shine through you. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, thank you for the promise that you're coming back again. Thank you that you saved us so that we don't have to face an eternity. Eternal, an eternal hell. Thank you that we have before us an eternity with you in heaven. But Lord, help us to realize there's many around us who are heading straight for hell. And what's so important is they need to see a living example of how Christ 
is so powerful and that he can change a life. And let our lives, Father, shine brightly so they can see you in us and come to know you as Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here today, Father, that has not come to the point of accepting you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I believe with all my heart now that they're under greater accountability because, Lord, they know that their rejection of you will send them straight to hell. So, Lord, I pray that they won't leave this place without getting things right with you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just shower them with your love and your grace and that you would draw them home. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse them. Make them into a shining example of your love and grace that others might come to see Jesus through them. Lord, use us all for your kingdom's glory. And Lord, I pray that as we give our gifts to you, Lord, that we will realize this is an act of worship. For, Father, we're giving just a small part of what you've given to us. And, Lord, we're trying to just be faithful and obedient to you. Lord, use these gifts to bring glory and honor to you. And, Lord, I ask that you please use us to bring glory and honor to you. Father, we thank you and we praise you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.